I am so excited to be here today. I, uh, there's so many great things that are going on, so many blessings that are going on in Topeka. Uh, there's times as a missionary, and you may not can relate to this, but there's times as a missionary that sometimes it's like, what am I going to say to all these people? What am I going to talk about? What am I going to, what, what good is there right now going on? Sometimes the field can kind of be dry and kind of be discouraging, and, and it's like, I don't know what I'm going to say. Today, it's, uh, what am I not going to say? Because there's so many blessings that God is doing, and so many great things that God is doing. I could, I could talk the whole service about the blessings that God is pouring out to us there in Topeka. I am super excited about what the Lord is doing. He is, he is running right now. He is moving, and I'm just trying to keep up with what He's doing. Shine Light Baptist Church is the name of the the work that we're doing there. One of the men uh, suggested that name, and I was a little bit hesitant on that. I'm like, I don't know. It's when you go to name a church and try to register as a nonprofit and all that stuff, and register with the government. There's a lot of names that are already taken. You know, like Emmanuel, Calvary. That's that's a new one, right? Uh, and, and so all the, all the biblical names are taken, and, and it's like it's, to find a name is difficult. And this one, this one I struggle with, but I actually like it because it, our theme verse, Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which art in heaven. And it's like that's what we're doing. We're trying to get out in our community and share the gospel and tell people about Jesus, and we're letting our light shine. And so I'm excited about it. At first I was like, that's not the name I wanted, and I wanted to pout and what have you. But I'm excited about it. I enjoy that name. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And so that's me and my lovely wife several years back and what photo and what have you. But anyway, sent out the Eastside Missionary Baptist Church. I realized this week that, that you are a young church. I did not know this until I got down here. I thought this church was, was, was a well-established and old church. And actually, you're a young church. And the reason I say that is because the church and me are the same age. That wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> Go to the next slide. Thank you. I want to say thank you, especially this church has been a blessing to me in so many ways. I am so happy to be here. I know you've been praying for us. You've sent financial support to us. You've answered. Sometimes I, I wonder if people are actually reading the reports that we write, and then and all of a sudden you're sending an offering or you're sending in prayers or what have you. And I've received a, a prayer letter from somebody within the church also, and it's, it's such a blessing. Uh, and so thank you, thank you so much that you're out there praying for us and, and, and paying attention to what God is doing. So the Lord started the work working with us about, uh, about Topeka in July 2020. You know, 2020 is a year that we'd like to all forget, right? We like to just all go away and just erase it out of our memory. And so I was in Colorado, and we were trying our best to do something there. And, and, sh and we'd been there for five years, and, and we were getting nowhere. And 2020 hit, and, and we tried to be creative and do everything we could, and we were still getting nowhere. So about April of 2020, I decided to do something. I was doing my daily readings, and I'm sitting at home like you were and not doing anything. And I'm like, I can't get out. I'm, but I have this tool in front of me called Facebook. And so I started getting on Facebook five days a week for about five minutes each day. And I do a devotion out of God's Word. I take one chapter a day, five days a week. If you do that, you can read the entire New Testament in a year. And so I started sharing a devotion five days a week uh, out of the New Testament, out of God's Word. And one young lady by the name of Megan, uh, Megan Jantz, or Megan Callahan now, started following me, started reconnecting with me. I led her to the Lord when she was a teenager, when we was in Lawrence, Kansas, and she started following along. And her and her husband was expecting their first child. In July of 2020, they had that child. And the reason I have that tra tragedy into triumph is because in July of 2020, they gave birth to that child, and a few days later, because of complications during childbirth, that child passed away. Everly didn't make it. And Megan and, and Alex, her husband, had reached out to me because they had been out of church for a long time, and they wanted me to come and do the funeral. You know, Colorado is right next door to Kansas. It was eight hours away, but it was right next door. And so I drove over and, and uh, did the funeral and reconnected with family and, and people I hadn't seen in a while. And, and then we went back home, and that, 
that tragedy was still going on and we started doing counseling sessions over the phone and over the internet and I would talk with her and Alex and I'd counsel them through their grief and through their situation. And then that turned into Bible study. We started studying through the book of James and we started th studying through the book of John and we were doing that once a week, just me and them. And then about January of 21, they asked me to come back over and preach a enjoyable message, not a funeral message, come back over and meet the whole family again, spend time and have an enjoyable service in their living room. And so we went back over and we had 12 people in that first service and we met there and we preached and I started talking to my sending church east side in Mena, Louisiana, that the Lord seems to be doing something in Topeka and nothing is happening in Colorado. And we began praying about that in August of 21, we made the transition. We made the jump and Rolled into Topeka, Kansas. Uh, we're almost to our two-year mark of being there. Go ahead, the next slide. We started with a small group. We started meeting in our home with about 12 people. In May of 23, we had got up to 16 in attendance. We were averaging about 16, 17. Uh, we had a uh, we had a older lady that Megan had reached. She's a hospice nurse. Through her nursing, her husband had passed away. This older lady, and she just showed up one day for services and been there pretty much ever since. And so they've been a blessing. Today, since May, we were averaging May 2023, just a couple months ago, we were averaging about 16, 17. Today, after Impact has come, and we had a large group come and help us in June do ministry and do outreach, we're averaging about 23 in services right now. And so we are super excited about that. So we currently meet inside my shop. I did not plan on this, but when we were looking for a place to live, the Lord blessed us with a place that had a shop with it. And uh, we began uh, remodeling that, painting it, cleaning it up. We've painted the walls, we've painted the ceiling. We've, uh, we've put in a uh, media center. Uh, we put a TV in, a sound system. We painted the floor. We put chairs in. We're able to meet inside this building. That is a picture of 23 people inside this 900 square foot uh, shop worshiping. And so we're excited about that. We can squeeze in, if God's people will do that, 40 people. Now, we don't have 40 chairs just yet. We're still, as one of our churches told us that they're going to purchase the chairs that we need, and we just need to pick them out. We'll have them before too long. But we can squeeze in. We don't. only thing we don't have in there, we have, we have air conditioners. We have heater when it, gets, when it gets cold. We don't have a restroom. And so they have to walk across the yard to, to my house, which is okay. And so they're enjoying it. They're they're, they're learning. It's not about where you meet. It's about who you meet with. And we're meeting with the Lord. And so they're enjoying it. And we have a good time. We worship in there. And we were we are super excited about what the Lord is doing. He's, he's filling up his house. And we're super excited about that. So last month, at the end of the month, we baptized these three. Uh, I'm, you see me there. And the next to me is a young lady by the name of Yvonne. Uh, Yvonne has been connected with us for a long time. She... Uh, She's come to craft nights, ladies' fellowships, kind of been connected, never came to church. We started getting ready for impact in June, and about April or May, she's like, you're going to be loving on Topeka. You're going to be sharing the gospel. You're going to be going out there and doing good things and blessing people. She said, I want to be part of that. So she started coming and helping us get ready for that, and she started hearing God's word and God's message. The Monday night of impact, uh, we got through our worship service. I preached that night. We had our prayer circles with our church groups. She's standing there in tears, and she's like, I've always believed in God. I just don't know what to do with Jesus. And you may be like that today. You've always believed in Christianity and God, and He's created all things, but you've never had a personal relationship with Jesus. And she, she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior that night, and then she followed in scriptural baptism. And, and I get tickled by her. I tell Tanner this all the time. She is raw. That backup, that's not that backup one. <laughs> and so she is, she is raw. And, and she'll, she'll ask questions that, that the church person who's been in church all their life probably wouldn't ask. And uh, she's like, oh, I'm sorry. She was coming for baptism. And I said, well, once you come for baptism, I'll present you to church for them to vote on you. She said, they can say no. <laughs> Technically, they could, but they're not going to. Ethan. Ethan in the middle is Megan's uh, brother, and he has been coming and growing. He, he's had baptism in the past, but he, he said, I'm not sure about my baptism. I want to make sure about that. Uh, this young man is getting into God's Word and growing so much. I'm excited about him. 
And then next to Ethan is Hannah. And Hannah is Tanner's uh, girlfriend. And he started bringing her, and she's falling in love with us. And she's making a journey to come and be with us. And so we baptized the three of them. Go ahead. So this slide, we just did this this past week. This past week's been busy. We, uh, we went out to a local elementary school. We cooked hamburgers and uh, bought bottled waters and chips, and we fed that staff of 65. And we got to speak to them and tell them what we were doing and encourage them, and so we're involved in our community. Go ahead to the next one. This is the police department. Impact was with us. This was my team, the, all the ones wearing the same shirts. Uh, we had cooked, hamb uh, not hamburgers, but hot dogs that day and had energy drinks and waters for them, washed their cars, their personal vehicles. The officer in the middle is uh, K-9 officer Gary Atchison. Uh, he lives close to me, and I've been working with him, uh, meeting with him, trying to encourage him. Uh, I am a volunteer police chaplain at the police department, and so I can, I can walk in. They all know me. I can show up at the scene. They know who I am. I've ridden with them in the K-9 unit. I've, I've rid done 100 ride-alongs so far with the police department. I have seen the ugliest part of Topeka. I have prayed with people. I've ministered to people. I've ministered with the children that were involved with domestic disputes. I've been right there with these officers. Pray for our first responders. This was my, our, was my main avenue of community outreach working in our community of Topeka. Go ahead, next one. Since then, the uh, police department asked me if I was doing anything with the fire department. They had a tragedy where three lives were lost in a house fire. And I said, I don't know how I can do this. And I went over and started meeting with the fire department. Last month, no, June, I'm sorry, June, I was, I've been working with administration about trying to get in as a chaplain because I'm not just a chaplain that you call in time of need. I'm going to be there ahead of time. I'm going to be there before the house catches on fire and burns down. And so administration was trying to get through things. But I was at the gym one day. Yes, I do go to the gym. Anyway, and so I was at the gym one day. And this firefighter was over there, and I just waved at him. And he came over, like, what? And I said, I am. And I started telling him my story. He happened to be the head of peer support. And he started opening doors for me. Since then, since, the month, since July the 20th, we have 12 fire stations in Topeka with three different ships. I have visited and touched, uh, shook hands with all three shifts of all 12 stations, so 36 shifts that I've gone and visited. The fire department is a completely different animal than the police department, if you don't know that. The police department is on guard all the time from the moment they hit the streets to the moment they come off the streets, where the fire department sits around the house and then the alarm goes off and they take off. And so I'm having opportunities to sit there and have conversations with them, and it's been a blessing. And so I have done, since then, I've done three ride-alongs with the fire department, and uh, I climbed out of the fire engine this last time, and one of my police officers was sitting there going like, <laughs> I'm like, dude, there's plenty of me to go around. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and so uh, I'm enjoying that. Pray for, the, pray for our first responders and for those efforts there. Go ahead. So a couple of needs, and I get into God's Word. We are trying to raise money for building and land fund. We just started that. Our group is maturing enough and growing enough that we're, we're ready to start looking at something else. We may not be in the, uh, to the step of buying and building yet, but we're, we're getting where we need to outgrow my shop. And so we're, we're just getting started with this. We've got $5,000 in a, in a building and land fund. Morrow, I think I spelled that right, Missionary Baptist Church, Morrow, Oklahoma, called me this past week and said that they're sending us $1,000 and they're willing to match up to $5,000 in funds to any churches or individuals that want to give to that to help us see that get to growing. So be in prayer about that. Uh, we need your prayers. Worship chairs. I told you there's a church that is actually uh, stepped up to that, and they're going to be sending us about 20 worship chairs here soon. And then supplies for first responders. I like to show up with gifts sometimes. Cases of Gatorade, cases of water, cases of energy drinks. They really like those, but those things are kind of pricey. And so show up and say, hey, our church bought these just as an appreciation, so it goes a long ways with them. So remember us in your prayers, and we are excited about what God is doing. Oh, the one thing I didn't make the slide, I didn't have a picture of him. Last Sunday, Tanner joined with us. I, I could have got a picture of you. But anyway, Tanner joined with us last night. There he is. 
Uh, but he joined with us last Sunday night, excited about him. He's come on board with us, and we're excited about that. But after services, and he left, and everybody left, I was sitting around with a young man by the name of Paul. Paul told me in June that he was a Buddhist, but he's been coming to church. And I shared with him the gospel. He hadn't seen it before. I showed him scriptures, and he was like, oh, man. He began to believe this is the word of God, but he's like, I, I, I just don't know. His wife, he lost his wife about six months ago in a car accident. He said, I don't know if I can believe, I don't know if I can trust Jesus or, or like Jesus because he took my wife from him. I said, you don't have to like everything about Jesus, but you just have to realize he's the true Savior. Sometimes I don't like everything God does, but I submit to it and say, yes, Lord, I'll follow. Last Sunday night, he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Yeah. It was a strange thing because we're sitting there talking. He's like, he got past the point of not liking Jesus. He was okay with that now. Then he got to the point, I don't know enough. You ever heard that argument before? I don't know enough. I'm not good enough. I don't think I'm, I'm mature enough. And I just used this verse where Galatians, I believe it's Galatians, says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and you get the point. I said, you're trying to have the fruit without the Spirit. You can't do that. You can't grow for God without God inside of you. And all of a sudden, a light bulb started going off in his head. He looks me square in the eyes, and he says, okay, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And he goes in his whole speech. And after he gets through with the speech, I'm like, that's wonderful. Now, who, who are you talking to? Well, I was talking to you. Well, you're talking to the wrong person. We need to talk to Jesus. <laughs> and so we went back and we prayed, and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. And so he's coming tonight for baptism, and we're excited about that. So the Lord is doing some great things. I, t I could talk all night about what God is doing. But let's get into God's Word. Luke chapter 6. I want to pray before we read this, kind of give a transition here. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this church and her love for missions and her, her pastor leading them to love missions. And Lord, I pray for this conference, Lord, that you would move in a mighty way. Lord, I'm so excited about the work you, you, you're doing here and the work that you're doing in Topeka. Lord, I cannot wait to get back home and be among the people that you blessed me with there. Uh, Lord, I thank you. Lord, be with the reading of your word this morning, the preaching of your word. Lord, speak through me to those that have gathered here to hear you speak. Lord, I thank you for this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Luke chapter 6, verse 6. I've been preaching through the book of Luke, and I came upon this passage a, a, a few weeks back, and I'm like, as you preach through a book, it's like there's passages. I've been, I've been in God's Word. I've been in the ministry for, for 31, 32 years. And there's, there's passages that I've never preached before. And this is one of them. And I, and I read this, and I'm like, what am I going to do with this? In Luke chapter 6, verse 6, it says, And it came to pass also on another Sabbath. That's an important note that Luke points out there. On another Sabbath, that he... That's Jesus, entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, if they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the men, to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose. And stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? And looking around about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. And so as preaching through this book, and I'm, I'm further along now, I'm, I'm, I'm in finishing chapter 8 tonight. But as preaching through this book, there's passages of scriptures that I've come to in my 31 years of ministry. It's like, okay, I've never preached this before and study this out and see what it is. And, there's, and as I'm looking at this, it's easy for us to get drawn into the fight that's there. And getting drawn into all the drama that's going on. 
We don't ever do that, do we? We don't ever get drawn into the drama, into the fight, into the, the argument that's happening. We see here that, that, that Jesus, Luke points out, this is happening on another Sabbath. Why did he say that? Because the passage just before this happened on a Sabbath also. Jesus and his disciples were walking through a, a wheat field, a, a cornfield, it kind of says there, but it's more like wheat. And they were hungry, and they took the, the grain, and they rubbed it in their hands, and they ate the grain. The Pharisees got all upset because they were working on the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees kept following Jesus around looking for accusation, reason that they might blame him, reason to say, well, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. And so there was all this drama going on. And here Jesus comes on another Sabbath, very important, and he stands there in the synagogue. Now, now it's not quite the same, but for us to relate it a little bit, for us to relate to our modern day, Jesus was in church. And Jesus is teaching in the church, and everybody came to worship together. And here they are worshiping together, so to speak. And you've got, you've got the Pharisees, and I would gesture, but some of you would get upset if I, if I did that. You know, you got the Pharisees, and again, no, I'm not, okay, I'm not doing that. I don't know you, I may point at the wrong people. <laughs> but anyway, and so, so they were doing that. And so they, they all gathered in there, and here's Jesus teaching, and there's disciples, and the, and the Pharisees were there, and they were all gathered in the church, if you will, to kind of relate to what we are. But there was this man there with a withered hand. This man had a problem. And he had come to church that day not looking to get involved in a fight. He had come to church that day not looking to get involved in the drama. He didn't care about what this person said or that person said or this person did or that person did. One of the situations I told Tanner, like the, I, when we came to church last night, I didn't know how many was going to be here. And I, when we came in last night, I said, well, I never know when I'm visiting a church and I'm a visiting missionary, the, the, the worst thing I can do is offend somebody. I don't want to get anybody upset. So when I come into a church, and especially because I'm one of the first ones there, I'm looking to see where can I sit you know, you ever been there? I don't want to sit in that person's pew. I don't want to sit in the wrong spot, right? Some churches have been really good about that. And some churches I've been to have, been, have had an issue about that. Where people are like, oh, you're sitting in my spot. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, and I move. And so I didn't want to do that. So where, where do we sit? We sit right on the front row, right? Hardly that anybody's going to be sitting on the front row. And so we sat on the front row last night and we did that. But, but this young man that was coming to church, he'd got the nerve up. He'd got the, he got the drive up. He's like, I've got a problem. I've got a need. I've got this withered hand. I'm going to church because Jesus is going to be there. I'm going to church because he can meet my needs. I've got a problem. I'm hurting. I'm struggling. I'm suffering. Listen. We are surrounded by hurting people all the time. Sometimes they're visibly hurting. We see that on the outside, whether it be a withered hand, whether it be a withered spirit, whether it be a broken spirit, whether it be somebody that is struggling with something. We are surrounded by people that are hurting all the time almost. Maybe today you have it all together. Maybe today you have it all figured out. Maybe today you're on top of the mountain. You're praising God. But there's other days that we are hurting in some form, some fashion. And we're like, I didn't come to, to get caught up in the Pharisees and Jesus. I came because Jesus was here and I'm hurting. I came because of this. We need to remember that that person may be dealing with self-worth issues. That person may be dealing with doubt. That person may be dealing with some past problems. That person may have baggage that they're bringing into God's house. They may have some emotional, mental, or physical issues that we cannot see or we know nothing about. And so when I talk about the man with the withered hand, I want you to think about those that we don't know that have some type of withered in their spirit, withered in their mind, withered in their hand, some problem, withered financially that we're dealing with. There was a young man this past week, I got a phone call uh, from his mother. His mother was in my ministry several years ago, 10, 13 years ago, different church, different town. But she called wanting prayers. This young man was 27 years old and took his own life. 
It was a shock. It was stunning. And what was the stunning, what was really shocking about it is he talked to no one. How long had he been broken? How long had he been hurting? How long had, it been, had his, his spirit been withered? We don't know. And so we look at this passage of Scripture, and I want to I bring out some good things out of this passage of Scripture. I want you to be encouraged today in God's Word. And so there's some good things that we can get in this passage of Scripture. First of all, being in the same place as the Lord is a good thing. Being in the same place as the Lord is a good thing. Verse 6, And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose hand was withered. Being in the same place as the Lord is a good thing. You know, the Bible tells us where two or three are gathered, he's in the midst, right? Being in God's house is a good thing because the Lord is there. Being among God's people is a good thing because God is there. Why was this man there? This man was a withered man. Some ancient theologians think that he uh, he was possibly a stonemason and that his hand had been crushed by working with stone. And if we think about that in our terms, we think, well, okay, he can make a living doing something else. He can can learn maybe his right hand was crushed and he can learn how to be left-handed. Maybe he can work using his voice. Maybe he can work doing different things. But in that culture, in that age... That was that man's livelihood. That was everything he had. And so not only was his hand crushed, but maybe his self-worth was crushed, and his finances was crushed, and his family was crushed. And every aspect that you can think of, this man was struggling and hurting. He went to God's house when God was there to have an encounter with God. Why do we go to church today? For God. That's a wonderful answer. But then, you know, there's a lot of different answers that we can come up with. Some of us go to church because that's what we've always done. You know, when I was growing up, I didn't ever ask my mom. I didn't ask my mom, are we going to church tomorrow? It was an obvious answer, wasn't it? You know, she was like, I didn't have a choice. There wasn't a vote in my house. My children, we didn't, take, we didn't discuss on Saturday if we were going to church on Sunday. We got up, we went to church. It was part of what we did. Okay, and so we, we do it because it's what we do. And that's a wonderful thing. I'm afraid lions are going to come out of this. But anyway, <laughs> it's like it's a gladiator cage. <laughs> I kept telling myself I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> there it was. And so we have all the different reasons why we go to church. And some is like because it's all what we always done. And maybe that's what you have done. We've gone to church all our life. We've been there. We've got our spot. We go to our class. We know everything about this church. You've been in church all your life, but you've never fallen in love with Jesus. Sometimes that's a problem. Or that's a problem all the time. Sometimes we were made to go. When I was young, I was made to go to church, and I praise God for that, that my mother and my grandparents, my aunts and my uncles made me go to church, okay? Because by making me go to church, I learned God's Word, and I grew up in God's Word, and I, and I, was, I fell in love with my Lord and Savior because they made me. There's a story of a, of a young man that was woke up one morning by his... He was woke up one morning, and he kept saying, I don't want to go to church, I don't want to go to church. And, and the response was, well, you need to go to church. You need to go to church. He's like, well, give me one reason I need to go to church. And she said, because you're the pastor. <laughs> right? Sometimes we feel like that. I don't want to go to church. Listen, I, I look forward to being with my people and the blessings that they bring me. There's, I can't always say that in my ministry, but I look forward to that. Maybe, they, maybe you go to church because it's expected of you. If I don't go to church, they'll, they'll call me. They expect me in church. I've got to man the doors, or I've got to do the security, or I've got to do the sound, or I've got to whatever. I've got responsibilities, and it's good for us to uphold our responsibilities. Maybe, they, maybe we go to church because we're seeking a change. Something's got to change. Something's got to be different. This man was seeking a change. He needed his hand to change. He needed his, his, his life to change. He needed something else. Maybe people come to church because they're lonely. They're looking for a companionship, whether it be husband, wife, lonely, or maybe because they're just lonely, period, and they need somebody to be a friend to them. Maybe it's just a custom. 
Why are we going to church? Are we seeking God in our life? Are we seeking more of Him in our life? What were some of the benefits of being there? He was being where Jesus was. You know, so often, so often what we do is we pray, Lord, Lord, come join me. Lord, come bless me in what I'm doing. While I was in Colorado, I kept saying, Lord, bless me here. Bless me here. And the Lord started working in Topeka, Kansas. And it's like, Lord, Lord, I want to be where you're working. Lord, I want to be where you're involved. If that means you're working there, I want to be there. Now, Topeka, Kansas isn't the most attractive part of Kansas. It isn't. My wife went to the university there. We were in Lawrence, Kansas, and my wife graduated from Washburn University there. And she drove through some of the rough parts of town. And so when we started talking about and praying about going to Topeka, my wife was like, eh, I don't know about that. That song that was sung earlier, I said, it's going to be okay. <laughs> you know, God's got this. He'll take care of us. It has been a tremendous blessing for us to there, be there. If we are where Jesus is, when he moves, when he moves, if we're, if we're where Jesus is, when he moves in that service, when he moves in that, uh, that, that message, when he moves in some ways, then, hey, we can get a blessing, right? If we're not in God's house when he starts pouring out his blessing, we're going to miss out. You ever been in one of those where a pastor's up talking about, man, that was a great service. That was so wonderful last week. It was so wonderful this morning. It was so wonderful last night. And you're like, what did I miss? You weren't where God was at, and you missed the blessing. We need to be where Jesus is at so when he moves, we're there to move. If this man with the withered hand hadn't been there, when Jesus said, come, stand here, he'd have been talking to nobody. It wouldn't have been that man. We've got problems, we've got burdens, we've got struggles, we've got hurt, we've got baggage. This is where you need to be. In God's house, waiting for God to move. If we are where Jesus is, then we are attentive to his movements. When we see him move, when we see him do things, when we're focused. Listen, when a small work, a mission, get back to that for a moment. When we're doing stuff, we get excited. If Brother Wes said, we had 23 last night, you'd probably been disappointed with that. I said, we had 23 last night. You know, it's a different perspective, right? And so I'm, I, I, sometimes when we, when we pastor larger groups and when sometimes we're in larger ministries, sometimes we lose sight of the one person. And that one person is just as vital as the 99, just as important. And so we get excited about the one person. Oh, we had one new visitor. We had new, one new person come. And we get excited about that. And I pray, Lord, let me never lose that excitement. Where was Jesus at exactly? The man was where the Lord was. Physically, he was there. Spiritually, he wasn't there yet, but he needed to get there. But Jesus called for the man, come join me. Notice, notice in that text when, he, when Jesus called for him, verse 8, but he, but he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Jesus called him, come to me. It wasn't the other way. The man didn't say, Jesus, come up here to me. When Jesus calls us, we need to go where he's at. Go where he tells us. Do what he asks us to do. Lord, that doesn't make any sense. Why do I need to do that? Just do it. Just do it. You know, what, what was it? Uh, was it Naaman? Was it Naaman and the leprosy in the Old Testament? And he's like, why do I get to be do it? Just do it. Just, do, just follow what God is asking us to do. God doesn't make any sense. Just do it. Just trust him. He was physically in the presence of the Lord, and he was in obedience to the Lord. When, it, when our Lord God says, I want you to scrub the commodes, yes, yes, Lord, I want to do that. I want you to stand and greet people at the door, yes, Lord, I want to do that. I want, 
I went to one of our young men a couple of weeks ago. I said, I got a job for you. We got a small little apartment fridge that has bottled waters in it that people can get and stand around and fellowship in our service. I said, I got a job for you. He said, okay. I said, it's nothing glory. He said, okay. I said, after service is over, I want you to restock the fridge each week. Okay. He's like, that's the job he wants to do. That's the job that he was given. And when God gives us a job, do it with all our might. All that God wants us to do. Not only being in the same place as the Lord is a good thing, but also doing good on the Lord's day is a good thing. Jesus asked a question there in verse 9. He says, then Jesus said to him, he's looking around. He's got the man with the withered hand standing there. And he looks around at all the people, and he knows their hearts, and he knows their mind. And he says this, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? Is it good to do good on the Lord's day? Is it good to minister to others on the Lord's day? Is it good to help those that are hurting on the Lord's day? Is it good to worship with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind on the Lord's day? Is it good to, to consider others and provoke others to good works on the Lord's day? Is it good to stay focused on the Word of God and the message of God and the lessons of God? Is it good to encourage one another? and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Is it good to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind on the Lord's day? Jesus asked this question. He said, is it lawful? Is it good? Is it right? And then notice what Jesus did. He didn't, he didn't wait for an answer. He went ahead and did what he was supposed to do. This trap was set. The Pharisees had a one-track mind. They were like, they were watching Jesus, and they were watching the withered man. They could care less about what Jesus was teaching. They could care less about what Jesus was saying. we got to watch this preacher and see what he does. i got to be careful not to go to meddling and stuff I don't know about. But anyway, they, were, they set this trap, and they had a one-track mind. They were only interested in trying to trap Jesus in something that they considered wrong. They sat and watched they didn't care about helping this man. They didn't care about this man's life being crushed. They didn't care about this man's hand being crushed. They didn't care about this man being alone and forgotten and struggling and suffering. They didn't care. One of the things we came up with at Shining Light Baptist Church there in Topeka is Shining Light Baptist Church cares. And I try to tell people that all the time. We care. And that, that, that's an acronym. It stands for something. Shining Light Baptist Church cares for our community it cares for all the things around us and it cares for our Lord and it, and it serves him the Lord saw an opportunity the Lord, Lord saw an opportunity to help this man he said you come you stand here you come stand by me you come here an opportunity to teach. He had an opportunity to teach what they were that where they were there he had an opportunity to teach by example an opportunity to do good if our ox falls into the ditch, what do we do? We'll get the ox out, right? That's what the Bible basically tells us. If the ox falls in the ditch, it's okay to get the ox out. This man was in the ditch. And Jesus is like, I'm going to get him out. I'm going to get him out. What about us? What are some good things that we can do on the Lord's Day? We can worship on the Lord's Day. Not just attend, not just be here, but actually truly worship our Lord. That our spirit communes with His spirit. That our thoughts are on His thoughts. That we are in communion with Him. That we are worshiping Him. Psalms tells us, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. And Psalms 99 9 says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. Our worship should not be held back. Our worship should be from the heart. Our worship should be a personal experience with the Lord. Teaching is good. Healing is good. Helping others. Listen, listen, church. We see somebody come in, and they may not be hurting, but they may be alone. We shouldn't leave somebody alone. We should offer to sit with them. We should offer to pray with them. We should offer to walk with them. I was, I was encouraged. We had, we had a prayer meeting in here this morning. And it was all new to me. I didn't, I didn't know what we were doing when we got in here. We mentioned prayer requests, and we shared about different things. And then Brother West said, okay, we pair up in twos, and, and we go off and pray. And 
I turned to Tanner and we prayed and we had a good time of prayer. And then I went to put my slides back there. And I heard some of the young men, or some of the men, look over at Tanner who was sitting by himself and say, Hey, do you want to join us? They didn't realize we'd already prayed. Do you want to join us? That's a great thing. Hey, do you want to sit at our table and eat with us? Do you want to sit with us at our pew? Well, I'll go, uh, this group around me, I'm about to tease somebody here, <laughs> was passing out certs. Who was passing out the candy? I didn't get one. <laughs> now she was probably thinking, well, he's about to preach. I don't want him to have candy in his mouth. That was what you were thinking, right? Okay, so... <laughs> See, I teased you and I saved you at the same time. All right. And so, but we see that. It's like we, somebody's hurting. We need to help them. They're alone. I don't want them to be alone. Helping is a good thing. Repentance is good. Getting right with the Lord is always a good thing. If God's people will repent, that's a good thing. Seeking forgiveness is good. Getting right with one another, with our brothers and sisters in God's house, is a good thing. Last thing I want you to get this morning. So we see that being in the same place as the Lord is a good thing. Am I where God wants me to be? Am I where God is at? That's a good thing. Doing good in God's house is a good thing. The last thing I want you to get is in verse 10. Stretching out for the Lord is a good thing. And looking around up, about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. I love how Jesus does things sometimes. He brings this man and stands in the midst. And he looks around at all of them and he says, is it good for me to heal on the, on the Sabbath? Is it good for me to do good on the Sabbath? Is it lawful for me to do these things on the Sabbath? And he, then he doesn't ask for an answer. He doesn't wait for an answer. And as he looked on all of them, he said, stretch out your hand. Now the man may have said, why? Everybody's seen it. Everybody knows what's wrong with my hand. Everybody knows the problems I'm carrying around. Everybody knows the struggles that I have. Why do I need to stretch out my hand? That makes no sense. Why do I want to show them my withered and crushed and humiliating hand? That makes no sense. But the man didn't say that. Jesus said, stretch forth thy hand. What did he do? He stretched forth his hand. And I believe as he stretched forth that hand, that hand took shape like it was supposed to. That hand began to get, uh, get healed like it was supposed to. That man that did not come there for the fight, did not come there for the drama. He came there because of Jesus. And everything Jesus asked him to do, he did it. And he went away healed. Listen, we need to stretch out. The Lord's asking some of us today to stretch out. You got those mission promises, those commitments. And maybe it's outside of your normal realm to say, I'm going to commit this much money. The Lord is asking you to stretch out. He's asking you, trust me with that commitment. But Lord, that's more than I think I can do. It's not more than He can do. Okay? Stretch out that commitment. And we're going to have an invitation and, and we're going to give you an opportunity to come and pray and pray with your pastor. Maybe pray at the altar or pray where you're at. And, and the Lord's saying, stretch out in prayer. But Lord, I, I don't think I need to do that. I'll just wait till services are over and I'll talk to the pastor. The Lord is saying, stretch out. Stretch out. Take that step. Maybe he's asking you to go to your brother or sister who you've wronged or, you've, or they've wronged you and seek forgiveness. And that's stretching out. That we're following the Lord. Listen, we need to stretch out our faith. We need to stretch out our love. We need to stretch out of our comfort zone. My people, I'm, super, I, I'm, I'm excited about them. They followed me in the evangelism. They have fought. They're not ready. They're not fully ready to, to com completely, as far as like taking a whole test and passing all the memory verses and, and knowing everything about the scripture as far as leading somebody to the Lord. But they know Jesus Christ. 
And I'm like, let's go, let's go talk to people. Last night we went out and we did a scavenger hunt with strangers. You said, what on earth is that? It's an outreach opportunity. We had a list of things they were supposed to do. Get a picture with a fire hydrant. Get a picture with a first responder. But every picture that you took had to either involve a stranger taking the picture or a stranger in the picture. And so when we did these scavenger hunt items, once we got through with the, the picture taken, we're all wearing our church shirts and we're like, hey, we're with Shine Light Baptist Church. Is there anything we can pray for you about? And all of a sudden we're having a gospel conversation on the street. And some of our people were like, I'm a little nervous about that. Stretch out. Stretch out. The Lord will be with you. Stretch out. God's asking you to do something this morning. I don't know what it is. But he's asking you maybe to make a commitment financially. Maybe to go to somebody, get something right. Maybe to seek the Lord's forgiveness. Maybe to get saved this morning. You don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior. As that young man that I was telling you about that was a Buddhist, that didn't know Jesus Christ, he had no idea who Jesus was and what have you. He got to the point, he's like, I want Jesus Christ my Savior. I believe in Him. That's stretching out. That we put our trust and our faith in what God is asking us to do. And sometimes it makes no sense. God, why do I need to stretch out my hand? They already know it's withered. But he didn't ask. He didn't say anything. When the Lord said, come stand, he stood. When the Lord said, stretch out, he stretched out. And he was healed. What are you waiting on this morning? What are you waiting on? Let's have prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day that you've given us. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to stand before these people and share your word. Lord, help us to stretch out today, that we would stretch out for you, maybe as a servant, maybe as a worker, maybe for salvation, Lord, that we would trust you and put our faith in you. Lord, I ask you to move in this service today, and Lord, let it be a good thing that we were here and doing good for you on the, on the Lord's day. Lord, I thank you again for all that you've done. Be with this invitation at this time, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.